I grew up on a beef farm in Missouri, and like everybody else that uh, raises livestock, we raise a lot of our own feed to stay in business, and we raise corn and soybeans and hay, and uh, we grind this stuff up into a flour, and we'd add vitamins and minerals and trace minerals, you make pellets, and you feed those calves for about six to nine months, and then you ship them off to be butchered or maybe to other feeders. And you always save back the very best ones for yourself, and you knock them in the head and eat them. It's a real simple cycle on the farm. And the thing that fascinated me as a teenager was that we went to a great deal of trouble for those calves, and yet, as a family, we ate out of the very same fields. We'd keep back five rows of corn for ourselves. We had a garden at the end of the field where we grew our peas and beans and squash and tomatoes. And we wanted to live to be 100 with no aches and pains, and we didn't give ourselves the very same vitamins and minerals and trace minerals that we gave the calves. And I always used to ask my dad, I'd say, hey, Pops, how come we go to all that trouble for those calves and, and not for ourselves? And uh, he'd say, shut up, boy. You're getting farm fresh food, fresh air, lots of free exercise. Don't ask complicated questions. And I was glad to get rid of the farm exercise and go to ag school at the University of Missouri. And there my major was in animal husbandry and nutrition. My minor was in field crops and soils. And I began to learn technical things about soil chemistry and how it related to tons and bushels per acre and ag economics. But I didn't get an answer to my basic question until I became a freshman veterinary student at the University of Missouri. And there I learned that the reason why we put all these vitamins and minerals and trace minerals into animal feeds, bottom line, is because we don't have insurance for them. We don't have Blue Cross, Blue Shield, major medical hospitalization, Medicare, Medicaid. And if we were to use a human health care type of system for animals, it'd be sticker shock for you. And your hamburger would cost you $275 a pound. Boneless, skinless chicken breast would be 450 bucks a pound. A dozen eggs would be $50 just to pay for the health care. So we learned that we could keep the price of animal products, such as meat and dairy and poultry and eggs, down to where the average American could afford them, simply by significantly reducing or totally eliminating health care costs. And we do that in animals by preventing and curing diseases with nutrition. Well, after graduating vet school, I went to Africa for a couple of years and got to work with Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom days. And that was kind of a kick. Got to play Frank Buck, use a tranquilizer gun, tromp all over Central and South Africa for a couple of years. And then uh, Marlon sent me a telegram and invited me back to the States. Uh, he'd gotten a $7.5 million grant to, from the National Institutes of Health. And this was more than 30 years ago. And this was to study pollution and ecology and the environment. And my job as the wildlife veterinarian on the project was to do autopsies of animals that died of natural causes in the big zoos around the United States. And I was supposed to identify or find a species of animals that was ultra sensitive to pollution. And we're going to use that animal much like the old coal miners used to use canaries. You know how that goes. They take the canary down in the mine, and if methane gas or carbon monoxide were to leak into the mine, the canaries were more sensitive than the men and uh, would drop off the Persian dye, and long before the men were in danger of suffocating or blowing up. Well, to make a long story short, after some 12 plus years of working on this project, I had done some 17,500 autopsies and over 454 species of animals, plus 3,000 human beings for a comparison. And what I learned was, that every animal and human being who dies of natural causes dies of a nutritional deficiency disease. And I got kind of excited about nutrition again. And I wrote 75 scientific papers on the subject, uh, wrote uh, chapters for eight multi-author textbooks, actually contributed uh, a textbook myself, 1,000 pages, 2,000 illustrations. And uh, through the news releases that were in the big universities I worked with, I was on 2020. It was in 1,700 newspapers around the world through the UPI and AP News Wire Services. And with all this public exposure and with all this scientific exposure, I couldn't get people who are in a position of authority, either in medical research or in politics, to get too concerned or interested in preventing and curing diseases in human beings with nutrition, just like we did in animals. Well, I got frustrated enough, I went back to school in Portland, Oregon, became a physician, and I practiced there for 12 years as a general family practitioner. And uh, I sewed up chainsaw wounds, delivered babies, um, used everything that I'd learned in veterinary nutrition on my human patients, and it was no surprise to me that it worked just as well in people as it did in animals. Well, to get started, I always like to talk about longevity, and the human being has the genetic potential to live healthily, to be 120, and I'm going to prove that to you in just a minute. Unfortunately, Americans do a lousy job when it comes to longevity. Our average lifespan in the United States is 75.5, about half we're genetically capable of. In 1990, when the World Health Organization examined the top 32 industrialized nations on Earth, the United States came out 17th. There was actually 16 other countries whose peoples live longer than we do. 
We rank 19th in healthfulness. That meant that there were 18 other countries whose peoples live longer than we do before they develop heart disease and cancer and diabetes and arthritis and osteoporosis. We rank 23rd when it came to live births and first year survivability as a babies. And we rank dead last, 32 out of 32, when it came to preventing birth defects. Now what all this means is we have the highest priced healthcare system in the world but not the best. It also means that we have the most envied healthcare system in the world, but not the best. We have the most technologically advanced healthcare system in the world, but not the best. Well, I had a good friend by the name of Christopher Bird uh, for many, many years, over 20 years, and Chris uh, was a best-selling author on books on organically grown food. He was an expert in this subject, and uh, I was always trying to give him vitamins and minerals, and he refused to take them, and he'd tell me, Doc, I bring my own cooler. I don't eat any uh, hotel food. I bring my own organically grown food, and so I don't need to take vitamins and minerals. Well, I was changing planes, uh, again, in Atlanta, had an hour to kill, picked up the local newspaper, and guess whose obituary I found in the newspaper? Chris Bird. Of course, again, he was a best-selling author of books, uh, The Secret Life of Plants, The Secrets of the Soil, and he died at age 68 from a ruptured aneurysm, a type of stroke, seven and a half years before the average American dies, and he led a pristine life, lived up in the mountains, had an organically grown garden, collected herbs, you know, like Yule Gibbons, and ate wild hickory nuts and all those kind of things. And because of his belief, he died of a copper deficiency. And I'll show you in a minute that copper deficiency causes ruptured aneurysms. And it's just a tragic thing that, that people have so much to give and die at less than half their genetic potential for longevity. A lot of people say to me, Doc, I don't need to take vitamins and minerals and trace minerals because I use herbs. Now, herbs are not nutrition. You have to understand that herbs are not nutrition. They are great plant medicines. Uh, they're safer. They're more economical and in most cases are more effective than prescription medications that doctors will give you, but they're plant medicines. If you have diarrhea, they can tighten you up. If you have constipation, they can loosen you up. If you have hypertension or high blood pressure, they can bring it down. If you have a fever, they can bring it down. But don't expect to get enough calcium or selenium or boron or copper or vitamin A from herbs. Well, I've been doing biomedical research and clinical research in animals and human beings, and I can tell you no matter how you look at health and longevity, whether it be in animals or human beings, there's only really two concepts you have to deal with. Concept number one I refer to as avoid stepping on the landmines. This is where you don't want to throw away your healthy physical body wastefully. You don't want to smoke. Don't abuse alcohol. Don't do drugs. Don't jog down the highway at 2 o'clock in the morning wearing an all-black ninja suit. You're going to get hit by a truck mirror, right? Whenever a doctor says, here's our options, never say, doc, whatever you say, you're the, you're the doctor. When a doctor says, here's our options, what you want to do is say, look, I want copies of all these records and tests, I want copies of the x-rays, and go visit three other doctors and three other hospitals. You want to talk to 12 of their living patients that had gone through this procedure. <laughs> talk to them, see if you really want to do this. I mean, you do this for your driveway and your roof and your fence and your yard and all that kind of stuff. Why not for your own physical body? That's concept number one. Now that you've avoided the landmines, you're in a good position to do all the positive things that you need to do to go on to live to be over 100. Basically, what you want to do is take all the essential nutrients, 60, that's 6 O minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, and 3 essential fatty acids. And they're called essential nutrients for two reasons. Number one, your body cannot manufacture them. You must consume these every day, either as food or as supplements. Number two, if any one of these essential nutrients is missing for a couple of months, a couple of years, you get on the average 10 deficiency diseases. You have everything to gain, nothing to lose by supplementing properly. Well, the medical profession, of course, has this malignant, dumb belief that you can get everything you need from your four food groups. My favorite article of all time in the press was uh, April 6, 1992, Time Magazine, cover article, The Real Power of Vitamins, New Research Shows It May Help Fight Cancer, Heart Disease, and the Ravages of Aging. Six positive pages. If you haven't read it, I'd urge you to go to a public library, school library, dig it out and read it. There was only one negative sentence, and as you might guess, it was offered by a medical doctor who was actually uh, uh, contacted by the writer of the article said, what do you think about vitamins and minerals and, and trace minerals as supplements for human nutrition? Here's what he said, quote, popping vitamins doesn't do you any good, sniffs Dr. Victor Herbert, a professor of medicine at New York City's Mount Sinai Medical School. We get all the vitamins we need in our diets and taking supplements just gives you expensive urine, unquote. Now, Missouri translation of that is you're just peeing away your money. You might as well wad up your dollars, throw them in a toilet, and flush them away. You can get everything you need from your four food groups, is what he's trying to say. Well, I'd rather pee out 50 cents or a dollar a day worth of excess vitamins and minerals. That's cheap insurance. Think about it. How much money you spend for coffee or soft drinks or newspapers and that kind of stuff every day. 50 cents to a dollar a day to maintain and repair your body. And it's kind of fascinating that most people don't do it. Just remember, when you pay that doctor out of your own pocket, or indirectly through insurance or indirectly through taxes, Medicare, Medicaid, not a single penny of that goes to better understand, manage, treat, prevent, or cure catastrophic diseases in kids, breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men. Now, a lot of people ask me, why did you call your original tape Dead Doctors Don't Lie? 
Well, that's because I, I believe for a long time, because I'd done medical research for over 20 years in large medical research institutes, medical schools, the various laboratories, and I always had a belief in the medical system, but I, I was very disappointed when I learned that doctors don't know the most about health and longevity. Doctors don't know the most about disease. They do know about procedures, you know, how to fix your bones when you break them and that sort of thing, how to do a CAT scan. And so I began to look in the medical journals and sure enough, the first article ever published on health and longevity of American doctors was published in JAMA on June 15, 1895, a little over 100 years ago. They said at that time doctors lived to be 54.6. I redid the study 97 years later using the same obituary techniques that uh, they did in JAMA. This was um, January 20th, 1993, in that particular issue of JAMA. And it turned out uh, the doctors uh, lived to be 57.6. I rounded up to 58 to give them the benefit of the doubt. And doctors just went berserk when I said that. I mean, this was the most outrageous thing that they ever heard. My principle is, my, my premise is, that doctors don't live as long as the average couch potato in America. And I purposely put that figure out there at 58 to try and challenge people. Well, doctors immediately looked at all the insurance actuarial charts. They got 250,000 dead doctors. They said, your group's too small. So they looked at 250,000 dead doctors, and they say, doctors don't live to be 58. They die at 62. They still don't live to be 75.5 like the average couch potato. We actually uh, re-ran this again uh, using the entire obituary history for 1996. And for the entire 1996, of all the doctors dying in 1996, with all the medical treatments and drugs and, and procedures and everything and transplants, Doctors and in that study lived to be 70, still five and a half years short of the average couch potato in America. So they still have never proven that doctors live as long as everybody else, and that's why dead doctors don't lie. <laughs> now, if you do everything right, how old can you live to be? Is it worth all the effort? I believe it is. Here's one. Christian Mortensen from San Rafael, California in August of 1995 turned 113. August of 1996, he turned 114. He's still going strong, certainly can live to be 115. Uh, smokes a couple of cigars a day like George Burns, who also lived to be over 100. Uh, certainly was, I guess the only exercise George Burns ever did was put the cigars in his mouth. This gal here, Dora Ramathebe from South Africa in July of 1995, turned 114. And when she was asked by the media, Dora, what do you attribute your health and longevity to? She did not say that we owe it all to our annual physical, our, our HMO. She said, I ate locust every day. You know, a little grasshopper. She's not a vegetarian. She's little animals. Pumpkin seeds, tortoise meat, wild herbs, dried fruit, and starts each day with a cup of coffee. This gal here, Margaret Skeets from Radford, Virginia, in 1994, was the oldest documented living American when she died at age 115. Fell over and fractured her hip. Three weeks later, she was dead from complications of osteoporosis, a simple calcium deficiency. And we'll talk more about this in a minute. Unfortunately, this is not unusual. 75% of all Americans over the age of 65 who fracture a hip or major leg bone don't live 90 days. They die of pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, stroke, and other complications of that fracture. Susie Brunson, according to her family, in December of 1994, was the oldest American when she died at age 123. And they base their claim on her birth date, December 25th, 1870, which was recorded in the family Bible. Then this fellow here, Francisco Barrison Wave of Chaparina, October 1995. He was from a little town outside of Bogota, Colombia, turned 125. When he was asked by the media, Francisco, what do you attribute your health and longevity to? He said, well, I drink a gallon of goat's milk every day. Also, it's kind of fascinating in his birthday announcement. This is not an obituary. This is a birthday announcement. He said that over 40 years ago, his physicians told him he only had a couple of months to live, so he had his sons build him a coffin. And uh, he's been waking up every morning for more than 40 years, sitting by that coffin, waiting to die. <laughs> Good night time comes, he goes to bed, wakes up the next morning, sits by the coffin, waits to die. Now, he's still going strong, and all the doctors who told him that more than 40 years ago are long since dead. Now, this fellow here, Hamoudi El Abdullah from Syria, died at age 133, and he was still fathering children after the age of 100. He um, remarried for the fourth time when he was age 80. Fathered four boys, five girls, nine children after the age of 80 with the same wife. And if you add up the pregnancies and the breastfeeding, the time in between pregnancies, he was still fathering children after the age of 100. Now this very next one is my very, very favorite. This gal, Mazumi Dusty from Iran, according to the Rocky Mountain News Wire Services out of Denver and the Iranian News Agency, this was January of 1995. She died at age 161. Now, you have to give a certain amount of credibility to this obituary report that she died at age 161 because she was survived by six living children ranging in age from 120 to 128. They hadn't even left home to go to college yet. <laughs> now, her oldest son, Golam, said his mother had never visited a doctor nor taken any chemical medications during her life, did take a few herbs. 
So if you kind of think about it, every one of these people who lived to be over 100, 120, 130, 160, these people are not from the United States or Canada or Germany or England. Kind of interesting, isn't it? They're, most of them are from third world countries. They're furthest away from medical help and they live to be old. So that we're beginning to collect information here. The last one we want to look at, the National Geographic Society, a very respected group of uh, people, scientists and, and so forth, and support groups for science. Uh, comes out with a monthly magazine, the National Geographic magazine, of course. And they, uh, in January of 1973, came out with a nifty special issue on longevity. They, they looked at cultures whose people live to be 120. And they documented the oldest living human being that they could find based on their criteria. This fellow, uh, by the name of Shirali Mismalov from Azerbaijan, a little country just south of Russian Georgia in western Russia today, they documented him as being 167 years old. Remember, this is the National Geographic Society, not the National Enquirer. 167 years of age, and they had a half-page picture of him actually harvesting tea leaves in a tea plantation, still working eight hours a day, six days a week, when he's 167. Five months later, May of 1973, Shirali Mismalov turns 168, goes out and hoes the garden for reporters to show how vigorous he is. Now, for at least 50, maybe 70 years, medical doctors in America have been poo-pooing the idea that you could live well beyond 100. You know, people who lived 115, 120, they were one in six billion. It wasn't something that everybody could look forward to. And anybody who tried to teach people how to live to be 110, 120, 140 were considered charlatans and quacks and taking advantage of uh, older people. I was glad to see this come out. Uh, this was a news article in the USA Today newspaper in October of 2000. And it was based on a article in the journal Science, a very respectable journal. And what they said was, forget 100, try living past 120. Humans possess a maximum life expectancy longer than 120 years, which has been the long theorized medical limit. In fact, lifespans appear to be increasing over time with no end in sight. Now the cute part of this is, now that there's no doubt about it, everybody agrees that human beings, including Americans, have the genetic capacity to live well beyond 120. And doctors want to take credit for it. The things that have actually increased our longevity from 45 average lifespan in 1895 to 75.5 today, which is an increase of about 30 and a half years, are sewers and good clean water, public health things. We don't have cholera and leptospirosis and tuberculosis in our food supply and our water supply anymore. We have meat inspection, we have uh, public water works and things, we have sewers. These are the things that have extended our lifespan. Then there's this salt thing. You know, whether you believe it or not, this medical dogma has really caused a lot of problems in America. How many have ever heard that using a salt shaker is bad? You're going to get hypertension, right? You're going to get heart disease and stroke. What's the first thing that a good farmer puts out for his livestock? A salt block or a salt lick, isn't it? There's nobody out in the pasture telling a cow she's limited to one lick a day. <laughs> I refuse to believe that my human patients are dumber than a cow. Say, so look, go ahead and pick up a salt shaker and you're going to see that lightning won't strike you. You can go ahead and salt your food to taste, you can salt your body, nothing bad is going to happen. And 98% of my patients love it. They bring me hundreds of new patients every month who want to use salt and not to feel guilty about it. And 2% of the bean counters, they say, now Wallach, we love you and respect you. We have this high-priced cardiologist that says you're flying in the face of all the weight of medical evidence. You can't tell people that um, they can use a salt shaker because you're going to kill them with high blood pressure and heart disease and stroke. And I've been vindicated in this belief. Uh, this was actually a study that was published in the New York Times, May 22, 1996. And this study was abstracted from JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the most prestigious medical journal in the world, according to themselves. <laughs> now, in this particular journal, a Dr. Alexander Gordon Logan, who is an epidemiologist and cardiologist on the teaching staff of the medical school at the University of Toronto up in Canada, and he took 56 existing studies on hypertension or high blood pressure and restriction of salt, combined the data from these 56 studies, which included 3,505 people. He threw away all the conclusions and reevaluated the larger group. And what he found out was this. If you have normal blood pressure and you restrict salt, it will not prevent you from getting heart disease or high blood pressure. If you have hypertension or high blood pressure and you restrict salt, 97% of those with high blood pressure or hypertension who restrict salt will not get any measurable benefit. 97% will not get any measurable benefit. Zero. 2-5% to 5 get measurable benefit, but it's not significant. They're only able to reduce their blood pressure by 3.7 millimeters of mercury. So here's what Dr. Alexander Gordon Logan said in JAMA, May 22, 1996. He said, you might as well go ahead and salt your food to taste. It's a meaningless exercise. Don't get paranoid about salt. 
It has nothing to do with blood pressure problems. There has never been one single iota of proof that restricting salt has any benefit. It's just one of those medical myths, he called it, but I'm going to call it a medical caca. Now, if it's not salt, what causes high blood pressure? Well, it's not salt, first of all, because salt is an essential nutrient. It has a combination of sodium and chloride, both of which you need. And according to the American Heart Association, the minimum daily requirement for a 150-pound person for salt each day is a heaping teaspoon, six to nine grams of salt a day. Now, the Japanese who live longer than we do, the Japanese who live 4.1 years longer than we do and have half the cancer rate, they eat 12 grams of salt a day. They eat three times the salt we do, and they live four years longer, have half the cardiovascular disease rate, and half the cancer rate we do, and yet they eat three times as much salt as we do. So you're beginning to put the puzzle together that doctors really don't know what they're talking about. That's why dead doctors don't lie. Well, if it's not the salt, and if it's not genetic, what is it? Well, it's actually just a simple mineral deficiency. Raise your hand if you ever heard that cholesterol's bad. And you've got to get it low in your blood. You've got to have a low cholesterol diet. Otherwise, you're going to get heart disease, right? Doctors would like to blame all cardiovascular disease on cholesterol. We've known for 75 years in the animal industry that cholesterol is not a boogeyman. There's not a single disease that's caused by elevated blood cholesterol or triglycerides. You can find me one. I'll give you a million dollars in small bills in any offshore account you want. There's not a single disease that's caused by elevated blood cholesterol or triglycerides. Elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides are really just a warning signal, much like a fever. Fevers don't cause infections, but when you have an infection with a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, maybe a parasite, you can get a fever, you can have a broken leg and get a fever, you can have cancer and get a fever, you can have liver disease and get a fever. Babies get a fever when they teethe. And so you have to kind of sort it out. When somebody comes into a doctor's office with a fever, you have to say, well, okay, here's my whole list it's called a differential diagnosis, all the things that cause fever. If they're 80 years old, you can quickly rule out teething, right? <laughs> but the rest of them, you may have to do some lab tests for them. At any rate, the same thing is true for elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides. When you have elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides, it might mean that you have hypothyroidism or low-functioning thyroid gland. You could have diabetes. You could have uh, deficiencies of niacin, chromium, vanadium, the essential fatty acids. You could have liver disease. All kinds of reasons why you might have elevated blood cholesterol and triglycerides, but they themselves don't cause any problems. Now, the Eskimos above the Arctic Circle have a traditional diet that's 98% red meat and blubber. Uh, they eat whale meat, whale blubber, uh, walrus meat, walrus blubber, seal meat, seal blubber, bear meat, bear fat. There's not a single Eskimo above the Arctic Circle that has a Mr. Juice Man juicer eats organically grown broccoli. <laughs> their uh, average uh, cholesterol ranges from 250 to 350, and yet they're legendary for not getting cardiovascular disease until they come down to the lower 48 and eat like us. Then when they get the cardiovascular disease, they go back home to die up above the Arctic Circle. They start eating whale blubber again, and it goes away. Well, learning all that, I felt very confident in telling my patients, look, we're going to do something different. My goal as a physician is to have my patients die at an average age of 100. I don't want my patients dying at 75.5. I want to give them another 25 years. I want the average lifespan for my patients to be 100. And uh, we're going to do something different. If you want to do everything that all the other doctors and patients are doing, I want you to go to them because I don't want you to lower my average, right? We're going to do something different. It's just real simple. My favorite disease is arthritis. I love arthritis. Now, the reason why I love arthritis is it's easy to fix. And when you can fix something as horrible and as debilitating, as painful and as expensive and as miserable as arthritis, you get kind of excited about this concept of preventing and curing diseases with nutrition. And uh, so I tell people about this arthritis thing all the time. So let's have a quick look at arthritis. Uh, number one, 75 to 80 percent of all Americans over the age of 50 get arthritis to one degree or of one type or another. And according to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, 35 to 50 million baby boomers are going to get arthritis in the next 7 to 10 years, and there's not a single medical treatment designed to prevent or fix it. Aspirin certainly doesn't fix arthritis, causes gastric bleeding and death. Tylenol doesn't fix arthritis, causes 50,000 cases of kidney failure each year, 5,000 of which are so severe you need a kidney transplant. Then there's ibuprofen, Advil, and Aleve. These things don't fix arthritis, and they cause liver disease in 2 to 5% of the users, including liver cirrhosis, even if you don't drink. And then there's methotrexate and gold shots. These things don't fix arthritis. They subdue your bone marrow so you can't make normal platelets and white blood cells. And then you have the granddaddies of all the medical treatments for arthritis, prednisone and cortisone. They don't fix arthritis. They subdue your immune system, which leaves you open to diseases far, far more horrible than arthritis. And prednisone and cortisone accelerate the loss of minerals from your bones, something you don't want when you have osteoporosis and arthritis. 
Now, when these prescription medications and over-the-counter medications don't work anymore to relieve pain and inflammation, the only thing left for you medically is joint replacement surgery. And uh, I, I never like to send my patients in for the joint replacement surgery because they never work out well. In fact, many times you're worse off after the surgery than you were before the surgery. The advantage my patients have always had is that I'm a veterinarian as well as a physician. And so I always used to tell my patients, look, we have all these nutritional formulas designed to prevent and cure diseases in animals, including arthritis. And so I tried adapting nutritional arthritis formulas designed to prevent and cure arthritis in pigeons and turkeys, dogs, cats, sheep, pigs, horses, cows, lions, tigers, and bears to human use. And it was no surprise to me. It works just as well in humans as it does in animals because it was designed to prevent and cure arthritis in pigs. And I've literally seen tens of thousands of people who've had a regrowth of cartilage, ligaments, tendons, connective tissue, bone foundation, bone matrix. Doesn't matter if they're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. I've seen people 97 years old regrow cartilage and bone even if they had bone to bone arthritis. If there's blood supply to that joint and that bone, they will regrow uh, bone and cartilage. Well, of course, Harvard Medical School goes berserk when you say stuff like that. Wallach, well, you can't say those things. The only thing left for people when they get bone-to-bone -bone arthritis is joint replacement surgery. And I'd, I'd agree with them if the only raw materials you're using is Tylenol and aspirin and prednisone and cortisone. We've learned over 50 years that you can't regrow cartilage and bone using those things. One of the basic things, of course, that the Harvard Medical School jumped onto, and they said, this is so ridiculous that this couldn't work. And so they took 29 patients, arthritis patients, who had failed to respond in any way to heroic medical treatment for arthritis, over 15 to 20 years. They took them off all their medication, wasn't working for them anyway, lined them up for joint replacement surgery, and they said, look, for 90 days before we do the surgery, they gave them a heaping tablespoon full of ground up chicken cartilage and their orange juice every morning for 90 days. They were sort of chuckling in their beer saying nothing's gonna happen. Well, here's what happened. In 10 days, these people, these 29 people, had complete relief of pain and inflammation, something they hadn't had in 15 to 20 years. In 30 days, they could now open up a new pickle jar that had never been opened without pain to the fingers, wrists, elbows, and shoulders. In 90 days, 28 of the 29 were clinically cured. Now, this is from Harvard Medical School in the Boston VA. That meant that they had complete return to the range of motion. All the pain and inflammation was gone in their fingers and toes and hips and knees and their neck. And uh, certainly, many of them still had knots on their fingers because it was only 90 days. And you'd think they'd call me up, uh, these professors you know, of medicine from Harvard Medical School and from the Boston VA, and say, look, Wallach, we have to apologize to you. We've been bad-mouthing you for 20 years. And why don't you come up to Boston? Let's talk about the whole thing. Here's what they said. Quote, after three months, it was clear that the drug was beneficial. Unquote. Chicken cartilage had become a drug in 90 days. <laughs> now, why would that happen? Well, because you can't patent chicken cartilage. And uh, they convinced at the U.S. Patent Office that they were using a drug to do this study. And they actually got a use patent on chicken cartilage. And you too, for 3,500 bucks a month, can get Harvard Medical School's chicken cartilage in a capsule for arthritis. Of course, cartilage has chondroitin sulfate in it, glucosamine sulfate, collagen. These are all the basic raw materials to rebuild cartilage and bone. Raise your hand if you know what the red warning lies for on the dashboard of a car truck. Back before we had dials showing temperatures and things, they used to use the red warning light, right? It was called the idiot light. And when that red warning light came on, it meant that your engine was heating up. You didn't have enough coolant or oil, or maybe you broke a fan belt or split a radiator hose. And a reasonable person would, would pull the vehicle, car, or truck over the side of the road and deal with the problem so you didn't burn the engine up. Even, even a Mercedes would burn up if you didn't have enough coolant and oil and a fan belt and a radiator hose. Then, of course, the village idiot, that's why they call it the village idiot light or the idiot light, uh, they'd be driving along, they'd see that red warning light come on. They'd say, I don't have time to deal with this. So they whip out their pliers, they cut the wire of the red warning light, and they keep on driving. Now, even a Mercedes will burn up if it doesn't have oil, coolant, a fan belt, and a radiator hose, right? And so you really have to be the village idiot to do that. Nobody in their right mind would do that to their vehicle. How many of you know what pain is for? Raise your hand if you know what pain is for. That's pretty good. Most of you know that. Pain is the red warning light for your body. When you get pain in your foot, your ankle, your leg, your knee, your hip, your back, your shoulders, elbows, wrists, and fingers, your body's saying, don't use those joints, don't use those bones, don't use those muscles until you fix them. It's absolutely criminal, absolutely criminal for a doctor to write you a prescription for a pain reliever, an anti-inflammatory or muscle relaxer, or any of those combinations without rebuilding the bones and the joints and the cartilage at the same time. If they just give you a pain reliever, just give you an anti-inflammatory and or a muscle relaxer without rebuilding the joints and the bones at the same time, all they're doing is cutting the wire of the red warning light. You're going to wear those bones and joints and cartilage out faster and faster and faster. It's actually a negative to be taking painkillers and anti-inflammatories without rebuilding the joints and the bones at the same time. The reason why I say no carbonated drinks, and I've been doing that since 1964, is because carbonated drinks actually will neutralize your stomach acid 
And you cannot efficiently absorb minerals, digest protein, or absorb vitamin B12 without stomach acid. You have to have stomach acid, like battery acid. Doctors have the criminal belief that you don't need stomach acid. And they give you all these drugs to get rid of your stomach acid, antacids, and they give you drugs to stop producing stomach acid, right? They don't want you to have stomach acid. Absolutely criminal. You can't digest food and absorb food without stomach acid. I know most of you knew that carbonated drinks neutralize stomach acid. If you remember back 25, 50, 75 years ago, when somebody would ask their doctor to say, look, I just ate, a, I overate, I overate a Thanksgiving dinner, and I have heartburn and indigestion, what do I do? And that was before they had Zantac. They say, well, take some 7-Up, drink some ginger ale, drink some club soda, take, take some uh, sparkling water, because the carbonation will neutralize your stomach acid and give you some relief, and it would. Now, if you do that three times a year, drink a carbonated drink three times a year for Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter because you overeat during those holidays, that's okay. You're going to survive. But when you're drinking two, three, four, five, six, eight, ten carbonated drinks a day, you're not going to survive because over the long haul, you will not be able to absorb the nutrients. You're going to get some horrible combination of terrible diseases. This came out in June of 2000, and this is a Harvard study on 460 junior high school girls in ninth and tenth grade. And what they found out was that those junior high school girls who drank one non-cola carbonated drink every day, they increased their risk of fractures and osteoporosis as a teenager by 300%. They found out that if they drank one carbonated cola drink, a cola carbonated drink every day, they increased their risk of fractures and osteoporosis as a teenager by 500%. Now, do you think that this is more dangerous for teenagers or adults? It's much more dangerous for adults because you only have 25% bone matrix and you're very, very slow to recover where teenagers have 40% bone matrix, and they can recover in a week's time. We learned in 1957 from a turkey study uh, where they took 250,000 turkeys, and they put them on a complete turkey pellet, trying to get them to finish for market within a few days or a week or so of each other. And in the first 13 weeks, fully half of them, 125,000 of them died. Farmers were out there every morning. They picked them up every morning by the bushel basketful, took them to the state diagnostic lab to see what they died from. When they opened them up, every one of them had died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm. And one of the clever pathologists says that's got to be due to a copper deficiency because copper is required to manufacture the elastic fibers of arteries and skin and other tissues. And the mechanism of an aneurysm is identical to the mechanism of a balloon on a weakened wall of a tire. You know when you hit a chuck hole with your tire and you break the cords, the internal pressure blows a balloon, you overload that tire with weight or heat it up on a highway, it blows out. Same way with an aneurysm. When you have a copper deficiency, you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers uh, in that artery, the internal pressure, even normal blood pressure will blow a balloon in that artery, and a balloon in an artery is called an aneurysm. And of course, if it's in a strategic place like the brain, the carotid artery, the coronary arteries, the large arteries, the AR to pulmonary artery, renal arteries, they blow out, you die suddenly, uh, just like you've been shot. Well, uh, they got excited about this. They doubled the amount of uh, copper in these um, pellets. The next year, they tried to raise 500,000 turkeys, and they did not lose a single one from a ruptured aneurysm. They went from a 50% loss to a 0% loss just by adding a little bit of copper to those pellets. So they said, well, maybe the same thing is true for humans. And in 1958, they started looking at uh, copper deficiency in various species of animals and humans, and here's what they found out. The very first symptom of copper deficiency is white, gray, and silver hair. Copper is required as a cofactor to manufacture hair pigment. doesn't matter if it's blonde, red, brown, or black hair. And I see a lot of copper deficiency in this room. I can almost tell you which people, men and women, who have colored their hair get pretty good at that, at being a physician. And you don't want to be like a medical doctor and just treat the symptoms. If you're just coloring your hair, you're treating the symptoms. You need to do the basic thing of take some colloidal copper. And if you don't, uh, what's going to happen is... Uh, you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in your skin and you start getting crow's feet around the corners of your eyes and your mouth. Parts of your anatomy begin to sag and you know you're in trouble when your doctor tells you, look, I've got a golf buddy down the hall who's a plastic surgeon for $10,000 who'll make you look 20 years younger. But you don't need a facelift, a booby lift, a tummy tuck or a derriere lift. All you need is some copper and everything will come back up just like you have a hydraulic jack under it. It'll just come right back up. Those elastic fibers tighten right up. People say, Francine, did you get a facelift? You look great. You look like you're 20 years younger. Now, if you don't take some action at that point, the next thing that happens is you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in the large veins of your legs, and you get varicose veins. If you don't take action at that point, you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in the large veins of your exhaust pipe, and you get hemorrhoids. So if you have hemorrhoids, varicose veins, things that sag, wrinkles, white, gray, or silver hair, the odds are you have aneurysms developing in you somewhere. And you don't want to, of course, die suddenly of a ruptured aneurysm when your body's been warning you for 10, 20, 30 years. Just remember, people don't die suddenly of an aneurysm. It may be you drop and die. Think about old Albert Einstein. 
He died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm at 68 years of age. What color was his hair? He was famous for wild white hair, wasn't he? Now, you'd like to think that people who win the Nobel Prize in medicine would at least live to be 75.5, but they live to be 58 just like other doctors. And, of course, that's because they are trained and they believe and they practice. You can get everything you need from your four food groups. doesn't matter if they win the Nobel Prize or not. This guy here, Dr. George Kohler, was the youngest person ever to win the Nobel Prize in medicine in history. 37 years old, wins the Nobel Prize in medicine, and he won the Nobel Prize in medicine for studying monoclonal antibodies, which are antibodies trained to attack cancer cells. And if they ever get this really working, it'll be great because they won't have to use chemotherapy anymore, which kills more people than it saves. 11 years after winning the Nobel Prize in medicine, Dr. George Kohler, now 48, drops dead of a cardiomyopathy heart attack because he believed you can get everything you need from your four food groups. Didn't take any selenium, died of a cardiomyopathy heart attack. Now, I have to tell you why athletes are an early warning system. Couch potatoes, by definition, are people who go to extraordinary efforts not to sweat, right? They make every human effort not to sweat. They're changing the TV channels. Honey, bring in the popcorn. I'm changing the channels. Son, bring me the TV guide. I'm changing the channels. By contrast, athletes have the attitude, no pain, no gain. And they're out there sweating and working away, power training, strength training, running, and they sweat. Athletes, no matter age, they sweat more in five years than couch potatoes do in 70 years. And when you sweat, you don't just sweat out potassium and Gatorade, you sweat out all 60 essential minerals. If you sweat out all of your selenium and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at higher risk of getting a cardiomyopathy heart attack. You sweat out all of your copper and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at high risk of developing an aneurysm and dying suddenly of a ruptured aneurysm. You sweat out all of your chromium and vanadium and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at higher risk of getting diabetes. And if you sweat out all of your calcium and magnesium and boron and zinc and sulfur and other minerals that are required for cartilage, ligaments, tendons, connective tissue, bone, you're going to get a joint and bone injury. What is the biggest single cause of an athlete's career being ended early? Joint and bone problems, right? And that's because they sweat out all the basic minerals that they need to maintain those parts of their body and they don't supplement with them because doctors tell them that they can get everything they need by eating their four food groups. Well, what are the early warning systems for mineral deficiencies. We already told you about white, gray, or silver hair for a copper deficiency. Liver spots or age spots on the back of your hand, side of your face or neck, these things are caused by a selenium deficiency. And you know, again, about selenium deficiency. Then, of course, uh, you have toe cramps, leg cramps. So you can have hypertension. These things are all caused by a deficiency of calcium. And if you're an athlete at age 25 or 15 and you get a leg cramp as a calcium deficiency, your body's telling you, if you don't stop drinking those Pepsis and start supplementing with some calcium, by the time you're 40, 50, 60 years old, you're going to have arthritis and osteoporosis. But most people say, well, I've got to get this high-priced trainer. I need somebody who can give me massage therapy because I have a cramp. And they don't go and take their supplements. 85% of the total mineral in your body is a calcium. There's 147 different diseases you can get from a calcium deficiency. We're just going to quickly go over the top 10 when it comes to the number of people affected and the amount of money involved. Let's look at osteoporosis, the number 10 killer of adults in the United States. Uh, remember, 75% of the, those over age 65 who fracture a hip or a major leg bone don't live 90 days. Also, it's the most horrible disease when it comes to human misery and dollars expended. Osteoporosis, think of the special vans and the lift gates and the ramps and the elevators, the special plumbing in homes and, and public buildings, special parking places, wheelchairs and walkers and canes. Think of the beds and the chairs that are little electric motors that lift you up when you can't stand up by yourself. Physical therapists, joint replacement surgeries, pharmaceuticals, doctor's visits. We're talking billions and billions of dollars for nothing more than a calcium deficiency disease. Now, as horrible as a disease as osteoporosis is in human beings, we don't have osteoporosis in animals because we don't have Blue Cross Blue Shield, major medical hospitalization, Medicare and Medicaid to pay for nonsensical surgical treatments for mineral deficiency. We've learned that by putting animals who are weaned off their mother's milk on calcium as soon as they're weaned, they won't get arthritis and osteoporosis. It's amazing how that works. Receding gums. Dentists and dental hygienists will tell you to floss and brush after every meal. If you believe that works, I have some oceanfront property in Montana to sell you. If you have receding gums, periodontitis, gingivitis, pyorrhea, loose teeth, bridges and plates, you actually have osteoporosis of the facial bones and the jaw bones. We don't get receding gums in animals, even though they don't floss or brush. That's because we've taken care of the osteoporosis problem in animals. Arthritis. 85% of all arthritis is called wear and tear arthritis. Osteoarthritis, degenerative arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, these things are nothing more than osteoporosis of the joint ends of the bones. Hypertension, high blood pressure, as you've learned, has nothing to do with salt or salt restriction. 85% of hypertension not related to kidney disease, 
which is most of them, not related to kidney disease, is in fact a calcium deficiency. Insomnia is not a deficiency of sleeping pills, halcyon or barbiturates, it's a deficiency of calcium. Kidney stones, bone spurs, heel spurs, and calcium deposits. Again, the medical profession has a malignant dumb belief that these things are due to too much calcium in your diet, tell you to give up calcium, when in fact, you only get kidney stones, bone spurs, heel spurs, and calcium deposits when you have raging osteoporosis. You actually need more calcium, more magnesium, not less. Cramps and twitches. Raise your hand. How many of you have ever had a toe cramp, foot cramp, leg cramp in your life? Sure. That's the first symptom of a calcium deficiency that most people recognize. So if you've ever had that sometime in your life, you've had a calcium deficiency. Then you have PMS. The University of California at San Diego came out and said that 85% of the emotional and physical stuff of PMS can be relieved, eliminated, and cured. They use the cure word by taking three times the RDA of calcium. Low back pain has nothing to do with disc problems. I know you've heard of people, maybe even yourself, have had a disc surgery for back pain. And after the surgery, you still had the pain, maybe even worse, because back pain is not caused by disc problems. If you have a disc problem, you can have numbness and tingling, maybe even paralysis if it's very severe, but disc problems do not cause pain. We learned in 1957 in animals that we could prevent and cure adult onset diabetes with two trace minerals, chromium and vanadium. In 1985, the medical school at the University of Vancouver, British Columbia, up in Canada, came out and said the trace mineral vanadium alone could replace insulin in adult onset diabetics. Science diet dog food has 40 minerals in it. Always has chromium, vanadium, lithium, and selenium. Ralston Perina Laboratory Rat Pellets has 28 minerals. Always contains chromium, vanadium, lithium, and selenium. I'll give anybody in this room a crisp new $100 bill if you can find me a human infant formula off the shelf of a grocery store that has more than 12 minerals in it. None of them contain chromium, vanadium, or lithium. Only one pro soybean, well two actually, pro soybean infamil, I believe, has uh, 12 because uh, they put in the um, selenium. The rest of them don't. They have 11, 10, 9, or 8 minerals. Our dogs get 40 minerals, our rats get 28, and our kids get 12 or less. You don't have to be a research scientist to realize why our kids are now getting all these horrible diseases that used to occur in people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. All these diseases that, that um, doctors are wondering, how, is this genetic? These kids shouldn't have this till they're 60. Well, that's because they couldn't get it out of their little can of stuff. If it's not in the can, they don't get it. Again, we need nutrients, 16 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, 3 essential fatty acids. And fortunately, over the thousands of years that human beings have been around, we haven't had to think much about this because our food plants, our grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts take carbon dioxide out of the air and manufacture long carbon chains, many of which are vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. And this is where this medical caca came from, that you can get everything you need from your four food groups. Because they say, well, plants, grains, fruits, vegetables, and nuts can manufacture vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. But we've tried this experiment for 200 years. Americans have eaten better than anybody else in the world. We've had the best quality food in the world over anybody else. And yet, we only live to be 75.5. We don't set any health or longevity records. So if you want to live to be over 100, can't get it from eating your four food groups. You can live to be 75.5. You may live 10 years older, 10 years younger, but on the average, 75.5. So if you want to live to be over 100, you do have to supplement with vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. There's uh, three types of minerals that you have to concern yourself with. First of all, there's metallic minerals. These are things like oyster shell, eggshell, limestone, coral calcium, seabed minerals, clays of various types, Tums is a popular one with doctors, lactates, gluconates, citrates, oxides, uh, sulfates, carbonates. These are nothing but ground up rocks. We're not designed to eat ground up rocks. Nobody can show you where uh, humans or animals are designed to eat ground up rocks. We're designed to get our minerals by eating plants, grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts. And as a result, plant-derived minerals are absorbable, more absorbable than chelated, more absorbable than the elemental or metallic minerals. Plant-derived minerals are liquid. They're very small particle size. They're 7,000 times smaller than a red blood cell. This is the way they're stored in your cells and are moved around in plant vascular systems and human vascular systems in the um, liquid plant-derived form. They're negatively charged. I don't know all of the physics and the chemistry. It's one of the basic features of a colloidal mineral that's negatively charged. These three factors together give you absorbability. Now, the way it's supposed to be is our food plants, our grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts, take the elemental or metallic minerals out of the soil, convert them to minerals for their own use, for their own metabolism and biochemistry, and then animals and people eat these plants that are enriched with minerals. That's how we're designed to get our minerals. Unfortunately, we have several problems here. For 100 years, we've used a simple fertilizer known as NPK. We put in three nutrients into the soil when we need 60 minerals. 
We put those three nutrients in the soil for maximum yields per ton and bushel per acre. Uh, then, of course, we have to understand that plants cannot manufacture minerals. If they're not in the soil, they're not in the plants. Plants only have minerals in them if they're in the soil. Plants cannot manufacture minerals. Over 90 years at least, we've been deficient in our soils in America, and as a result, our food is deficient, and as a result, the crops, the grains, fruits, vegetables, and nuts that are grown there are minerally deficient, and as a result, the animals and people who eat these minerally deficient crops get mineral deficiency diseases, and the only way to prevent and cure them is with mineral supplements. Yes, I'm a construction worker, and um, I hurt my back, and he said that my uh, cartilage damage is permanent. Is there anything that can be done? Well, and first of all, how old are you? I'm 28 years old. And what do you normally take for fluid replacement when you're working out in construction? What do you drink during the day? Uh, water, Gatorade. You don't drink any soft drinks? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, because normally construction workers drink a couple of liters of Pepsi a day, right? Yeah, I can probably put down a liter pretty easy. <laughs> And did you take any vitamins or minerals that we were working in construction? Um, just recently started. Well, when you were in construction prior to the no. back problems? No. Yeah, a lot of con construction workers will tell me, well, Doc, if it ain't in the Pepsi, I don't get it, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so uh, you're a perfect candidate for the pig arthritis formula plus the EFA. You need all 90 essential nutrients and give up the bad things. Give up the soft drinks and the iced tea and the lemonades and, and um, give up the fried foods and the margarines. And uh, I can just tell you, with your age, uh, you can honestly expect to see some uh, really recognizable results in a very, very short time, 60 to 90 days. And it doesn't matter what the doctor said. If you do the right things, get rid of the bad stuff, take all 90 essential nutrients, uh, making sure you get that collagen and the glucosamine sulfate and the chondroitin sulfate, uh, you will repair your vertebrae, you will repair the cartilage, and you will repair the disc. Dr. Wallach, it just seems like every week I pick up a newspaper and I see about our young athletes having problems with their bodies falling apart. What can we give our athletes and our children so that they can be healthy and have long lives that we want as well? That's a great question because most people believe that exercise is good for you. And that was always a great question. You know, is exercise good for you? Is it necessary for health and longevity? And when you inspect this question, uh, you have to look at professional athletes who uh, spend most of their teenage years and going through university and the semi-pros and the pros uh, training and practicing and doing their events. And, and if exercise was the factor in living a long, healthful life, athletes should live longer than couch potatoes. But when you look at this critically, couch potatoes in America live to be 75.5, and the average athlete, depending on the sport and their level of competence, live to be 62 to 68, far short of what a couch potato lives to be. And of course, athletes suffer from a great many joint diseases and bone injuries and tendons and ligaments, back, neck, shoulders, ankles, knees, and hips, and have to suffer through an enormous amount of surgeries to deal with this. And athletes develop some 800 different diseases. And what is it? Why is it that athletes don't fare as well as the couch potato? Well, it's simply because athletes sweat more in five years than couch potatoes do in 75 years. And when you sweat, you're not just sweating out Gatorade, you're sweating out all 60 essential minerals. And they're called essential minerals because if they're missing for any length of time, you get some horrible degenerative disease, many of which are, are life-threatening. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out who's more likely to be debilitated or even die of these, these life-threatening diseases. An athlete who sweats out quarts of sweat during an event or training or practice or a couch potato who's laying on a couch in an air-conditioned den, switching the channels, yelling, honey, bring in the popcorn, I'm changing the channels. And this is very serious because the Center for Disease Control says that as many as 100,000 young athletes under the age of 30, 100,000 each year die suddenly during an event or training or exercise or immediately after an event from cardiomyopathy, heart disease, and ruptured aneurysm. And we know that cardiomyopathy, heart disease is due to a selenium deficiency and ruptured aneurysms is due to a copper deficiency. So you can begin to put two and two together. Why does a 10-year-old die of a ruptured aneurysm? Well, you sweat out all of his copper, and you can't get copper from curly French fries and Pepsis. It just doesn't work. Dr. Wallach, what about arthritis? Well, arthritis is my favorite disease because it's easy to fix. Uh, it's one of the great myths that uh, the medical profession perpetuates is that uh, you can't build bone mass after the age of 50, 60, 70 years of age. You can only slow down the loss. 
And the reason why they say that uh, is because they try to rebuild bone mass using plain calcium, whether it's Tums or calcium citrate or carbonate or gluconate or, or lactate, and your body will not retain much or any of the calcium you supplement with in your bones without first building new bone matrix. You have to have new bone matrix. This is this, this rubbery collagen material that looks like tendon or skin and it makes up 25 to 40 percent of our bone weight, 40 percent when you're a child and 25 percent when you're an adult. And so it's absolutely essential if you want to deal with the wear and tear arthritis, osteoarthritis, degenerative arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis effectively, you have to take all 90 essential nutrients and the best way to do that is with Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula. Remember, I'm a veterinarian as well as a physician, and we learned a long time ago, maybe 100 years ago in veterinary medicine, that we could actually prevent and reverse, maybe even use the cure word in animals, uh, arthritis, simply by giving the animal the raw material to develop properly and to maintain and repair the joints. And so using this information that we developed in animals, if you use the same concept for human beings, I have literally seen tens of thousands of people over the years who had bone-to-bone -bone arthritis, they had osteoarthritis, they have degenerative arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, which are basically a, a joint form of osteoporosis. It's osteoporosis, the joint ends of the bones, and they've tried all kinds of medication. And of course, if you take medication, if you take a painkiller, if you take an anti-inflammatory for arthritis, essentially all you're doing is cutting the wire to the red warning light. Pain in a joint says, don't use me until you fix me. And by taking a painkiller, by taking an anti-inflammatory, which will reduce pain, you're allowing that joint to be used even though it would have been painful without the drug. And so you're wearing that joint out faster and faster and faster. And to me, it's criminally negligent for someone to be prescribed a painkiller or an anti-inflammatory for joint disease without repairing the joint at the same time. And this is where the pig arthritis formula really shines and it works just like a charm in human beings. So does the same apply for bone spurs? Absolutely. Bone spurs are a manifestation of osteoporosis. A person will get bone spurs and calcium deposits when you have osteoporosis, just the opposite of what a doctor will tell you. And you need more calcium, more magnesium. You need the bone matrix. You need the collagen, the glucosamine sulfate, the chondrite and sulfate. And those bone spurs and the calcium deposits will actually re-architecture back down to a normal bone. It takes a little while. It takes uh, four to six months to pull that off. But you can uh, do it on a regular basis, absolutely. Cancer seems to be striking everywhere in our population these days. What do we have that we can help people that are facing the challenge of cancer? Well, that's a great question. Uh, back at the turn of the century, 1895-1900, one out of ten Americans developed cancer. Right now, it's three out of five, and by the year 2050, it's projected two out of three people are going to develop cancer in America. The onset of cancer appears uh, to be directly related to the amount of, of carcinogens. These are toxic waste either from agriculture or from the industrial waste that we find in our air and our food and our water and in the dust around us. And the lack of the ability to defend against these, these carcinogens and the most common defense mechanism that we have, the, the one that we have access to in a very economical way, are the antioxidants like selenium, like the grapeseed extract, like the green tea. You're looking at vitamin E, vitamin C, beta carotene, and avoiding fried foods and margarines and, and things that we have control of, eating as much organically grown food as possible. And according to the medical school at the University of Arizona, and this came out in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, December 25th, 1996. I mean, we're talking about a great Christmas gift to the American people. They did a wonderful study, 10 years. It was a double-blind study, 1,300 people. They gave the study group 250 micrograms, which is one quarter of one milligram. I and mean, we're talking an itsy, bitsy amount of selenium. They just used selenium alone. Didn't change anything else. And by giving these people 250 micrograms, one quarter of a milligram of the trace mineral selenium, they were able to reduce the risk of esophageal cancer by 71%, prostate cancer by 69%, greater than two-thirds, colon and rectal cancer by 64%, almost two-thirds. Lung cancer was reduced by 48% whether you smoked or not. And in a parallel study from the University of California, San Diego, 250 micrograms, one quarter of one milligram of selenium, the trace mineral selenium, reduced the risk of breast cancer by 50 to 
And the same study showed that if you already have cancer, if you take 250 micrograms of selenium every day, uh, you will in fact double the natural history life expectancy of a particular type of cancer. For instance, lung cancer, the natural history is about a year. Brain cancer is less than a year. Uh, uterine, ovarian, colon, uh, breast cancer is two to five years. Prostate cancer is five to eight years. Well, just by taking 250 micrograms of the trace mineral selenium every day, one quarter of one milligram, according to the University of, of Arizona's uh, medical school, uh, you can double that life expectancy just by doing that one thing. And so if you take the other antioxidants and give up margins and fried foods and sugar and caffeine and avoid as many of the agricultural waste and the toxic waste from the industry that you can, you will be able to avoid an enormous amount of cancer. And if you already have cancer, doing other things such as taking the um, antioxidants and getting on macrobiotic diets and, and so forth, you can add many healthful years to your life. You can certainly have a better quality of life. And many people uh, will extend their lives in a, in a great way, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And obviously, there's no way you can look in somebody's eyes and say, you're the one that's going to live 50 years. And so people just have to do all the right things, and they're going to get the best that can be gotten from nutrition and the, the supplements. Dr. Wallach, I've been a diabetic for about 30 years. What, can, what kind of minerals should I take to help me? Okay, well, first of all, are you an adult onset type 2 diabetic or a juvenile onset type 1 diabetic? Juvenile, juvenile onset type 1. You are in, insulin dependent because the definition of a juvenile onset type 1 diabetic is that you do not make any insulin, and so you will never be able to wean off of insulin. You will always have to take some insulin. But uh, there are two trace minerals, chromium and vanadium, that will make the insulin that you supplement yourself with very efficient. And most people who are juvenile onset type 1 diabetics are able to reduce the amount of insulin they require to stabilize their blood sugar uh, by supplementing with the chromium and vanadium. Normally, a person learns how to adjust their insulin by taking their blood sugar once or twice or three times a day. And so you're taught how to adjust your insulin intake. And just by following what you've been taught, uh, as you supplement with this plant-derived colloidal and the chelated chromium and vanadium, you will be able to get down to a new dosage of uh, your insulin. And the value of taking the whole pig arthritis formula is that th there's nothing worse than paying attention to your blood sugar levels and your insulin intake and then dying of a ruptured aneurysm because you didn't su supplement with copper or developing cancer because you didn't supplement with selenium. So it's very important, even though you're a diabetic, and that is your primary immediate concern, still over the long haul, uh, being a health conscious person just out of necessity, uh, you're going to have to supplement with all 90 essential nutrients. And uh, the odds are, even though you're a juvenile onset type 1 diabetic, you have every honest expectation of living to be 100, uh, symptom free, if you do everything right. Yes, my question is on Alzheimer's. Why is it more prevalent today that, than it was 15, 20 years ago? Well, actually, Alzheimer's disease was a disease that did not exist 40 years ago. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, even by another name, could not be found in any medical dictionary or textbook or taught in any medical curriculum. It only became an entity in the medical literature in 1979. And today, it's apparently the number four killer of adults in the United States over the age of 65 behind cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and then comes Alzheimer's disease. And it, it appears uh, to me with no doubt that it's due to what I call a physician-caused disease because doctors have, have encouraged people, in fact demanded that people uh, give up saturated fat and cholesterol and move towards a cholesterol-restricted or even a cholesterol-free diet to get their blood cholesterol down below 200. And they have created no less than 25 of these cholesterol deficiency diseases. And to me, Alzheimer's disease is one of the big ones. 75% of our brain weight is pure cholesterol. It's called myelin. It's this fatty stuff that insulates each nerve fiber of the brain and spinal cord. And we can only make about 10% of our daily need of cholesterol. The other 90% must come from the diet. And if a person is very, very good at giving up chicken skin and red meat and dairy and eggs like a doctor would have them do, after about six or eight or ten years, they're not going to be able to keep up with the maintenance and repair needs of the cholesterol for the myelin in the brain and spinal cord. And so you can just expect that the person's going to develop one or more of these 25 physician-caused diseases, including acquired seizure disorders and Alzheimer's disease. Now, the best way to avoid Alzheimer's disease is to eat a couple of eggs every morning for breakfast, not cooked in margarine or fried. Uh, you want to consume as much as 72 ounces of red meat 
every month. And I know that sounds like a lot, but it's just a quarter pounder a day. And uh, you want to supplement with all 90 essential nutrients. And when you get to the, the vitamin E level, you want to have at least 2,000 international units of vitamin E and you want 500 micrograms of selenium. And if you do that, even if you already have Alzheimer's disease, you can expect to have a significant amount of return of memory. Great study done by the University of California, San Diego, and the Salk Institute that says by taking 2,000 international units of vitamin E alone, even if you have advanced Alzheimer's disease, you can get a significant amount of, of memory return. I remodel homes for families. You notice these little children bouncing off of walls and uh, what they get for breakfast and a snack after breakfast and then lunch again normally has sugar in it. Is there any uh, correlation here with uh, ADD? Absolutely. Back at the turn of the century, 1895 to 1900, Americans were eating a half a pound of sugar per person per year. Today it's 150 pounds of sugar per person per year and somebody out there is eating 300 pounds because I don't eat any. And I can tell you that there's a direct correlation between the increase in ADD, ADHD, depression, manic depression, bipolar disease, and the increased consumption of sugar. And if you look at it, there's five million American children, school-age children, who are on Ritalin and Prozac and Amipramine and other antidepressants in school. Five million drugged American kids in, in the preschool and uh, elementary school, simply because these kids are sensitive to sugar, like many people are sensitive to alcohol. Uh, there's good alcoholics who just kind of go to sleep when they have a couple of drinks. Uh, there's the people who get boisterous and sing loud Irish songs when they take a couple of drinks. And there's some people who get violent and, and very angry and become dangerous to themselves and other people. Uh, child abuse, spouse abuse, they abuse their neighbors. Road rage is another way of looking at this. Uh, Life-threatening situations. Uh, people actually will gain criminal behavior sometimes because alcohol acts like a drug in them. Same way with sugar. Some people, when they take in sugar, they have low blood sugar and they just get drowsy and fall asleep. Some people, when they take in sugar, they get hyperactive and boisterous and, and uh, actually uh, ADD, ADHD. And then there's some people, when they take in sugar, again, will have road rage. Uh, they're very, very um, uh, aggressive and reactive and can be dangerous to themselves and their families and other people in the community. And to me, it's criminal for Coca-Cola machines and, and candy machines in school and then wonder why kids beat up on each other or shoot each other. Well, in addition to getting all the sugar out of their life from sugar frosted flakes and Pepsis and Reese's peanut butter cups and candy and, and pop tarts and syrup on their egos, uh, they have to supplement with all 90 essential nutrients, even little kids from the moment they're born to develop properly. This includes their emotions and repair and maintain themselves and especially lithium, chromium and vanadium. And there's an enormous amount of research in human beings which show that lithium deficiency results in uh, hyperactivity, ADD, ADHD, depression, manic depression, and criminal behavior. And so they have to do both. And uh, you can avoid all this. Uh, it's amazing. Just within days, they will be perfectly normal little kids. My next question is, my husband and I are thinking about starting a family, and we want to know the, the nutritional way to go. Okay, that's a great question. People always ask me, well, when, when do children need to start taking vitamins and minerals? And the answer is, when they're still an egg is when you want to start them. And so uh, we've learned in the animal industry, and remember I'm a veterinarian as well as a physician, we've learned in the animal industry that we could prevent as much as 98% of all birth defects, even ones that are thought to be genetic in humans, simply by giving the females, especially the females, all known essential nutrients for that species six months prior to conception. Build up that female animal's body in stores of these essential nutrients so that the embryo implants in the uterine wall and develops in an environment that has optimal amounts, guaranteed optimal amounts of all the nutrients, and you will almost eliminate the possibility of a congenital birth defect related to a mineral or vitamin or amino acid or essential fatty acid deficiency. To give you some idea of how successful this is, according to the University of California, San Francisco, right now in America, one out of every 33 human babies in America are born with some physical or emotional or mental birth defect. One out of 33. In animals, it's only one out of 500,000 if they're fed these commercial diets that have all the known nutrients in them. And so it's just very, very easy to understand, well, if we supplement young women and men who are in the childbearing years with these nutrients, that we'll be able to eliminate, totally eliminate, cleft palates, cleft lips, spina bifida, eye defects, heart defects, hernias of various types, 
club feet, no feet, web fingers and toes, no fingers and toes, uh, muscular dystrophy, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, cystic fibrosis. These are all preventable with proper preconception nutrition. So the earlier that a couple who wants to uh, have normal, healthy children and have a, a wonderful, uncomplicated pregnancy, the earlier you can get on all 90 essential nutrients prior to conception, the better off everybody is. Hello, Dr. Wallach. The women in my family are plagued with hay fever and asthma and allergies, and I don't want to join those ranks. Is there a better way? Absolutely. Uh, let's start with asthma. It's the easiest one to deal with. Asthma is actually a deficiency of three nutrients, magnesium, manganese, and the essential fatty acids. And by taking the pig arthritis formula twice a day, you're going to get the optimal amounts of the plant-derived colloidal and the chelated magnesium and manganese and then by taking the minimum daily requirement, the nine grams of the essential fatty acids, and those three nutrients together, the magnesium, manganese, and the essential fatty acids, will allow you to produce what's called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are little short-lived hormones that last in your bloodstream 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and your body is continuously making them, kind of rapid fire. And when you don't have those three nutrients, you cannot make the proper prostaglandins to keep your bronchi and your trachea open, and that's when you develop asthma. And it's very common when people take all 90 essential nutrients, including the magnesium and manganese and the essential fatty acids. Within weeks or months, the tightness, this constant tightness in their chest is significantly reduced or maybe even totally relieved. The frequency and the severity of their asthma attacks is reduced. I would certainly still keep an inhaler available until she, you know, in case you had some unexpected emergency, kind of like wearing your seat belt, even though you're on a smooth flight and you, you're not going to uh, anticipate sudden turbulence. You need to be pre prepared for emergencies, but um, you have every honest expectation of doing very well. Then, as far as inhalant allergies from dust and pollens and uh, seasonal ones from dust and pollens and maybe constant ones from danders and cats and dogs and chickens and feathers and your pillows and that kind of thing, uh, maybe even chemicals that come out of rugs and formica and new cars like formaldehyde and other chemicals. Um, you want to get your immune system working optimally so it can protect you from these things because most people are able to tolerate them. And what happens is when your immune system doesn't have enough nutrition to function optimally, uh, you become a victim of these things assaulting you all the time. And so what you want to do is, number one, take all 90 essential nutrients. So your immune system, which includes your liver and your spleen, your tonsils and your appendix, uh, your thymus, uh, your um, white blood cells, which include the neutrophils and the lymphocytes and the uh, killer T cells and so forth. Also, you have eosinophils and basophils. You have neutrophils. All of these are white blood cells. You have albumins and globulins, which are the the um, immune proteins, you have antibodies themselves, you have your digestive system, your skin, your tears, the mucus in your body, all of that requires 90 essential nutrients to produce this immune system, which is not just your killer T cells, uh, it, it includes all of these tissues and, and cells and organs of your body. Uh, also, if you have these types of problems, you want to get uh, some of these HEPA filters uh, at your workplace, in your home when you sleep, you can get the ones that you plug in your car, you want to eat as much organically grown food as possible. You want to drink filtered uh, waters. You want to get as much chemicals out of your diet as possible and to reduce this pressure on your immune system. If you have food allergies, you want to have a five-day rotation diet. You want to take the enzyme, which has the pepsin and the betaine hydrochloride, which will help a person digest the proteins down into single amino acid. And it's the proteins and the allergens, such as danders and foods and pollens and dust, that cause the, the uh, allergies and even can initiate an attack of asthma. Thank you. You're very welcome. Is it possible that you can take too much? Well, that's a great question because people are concerned about overdosing with vitamins and minerals. The general answer is that if you look at the medical profession, according to the Center for Disease Control, Harvard Medical School, the U.S. News and World Report, Ralph Nader, Sidney Wolf, Rand Corporation, and many, many other well-respected institutions, they say that doctors kill 150,000 to 300,000 Americans each year in hospitals alone as a result of medical negligence. Doctors injure 1.3 million Americans each year in hospitals alone as a result of medical negligence. And doctors infect 2 million Americans alone 
in hospitals as a result of medical negligence for a total of three and a half million casualties inflicted on the American public each year in hospitals just as, as a result of medical negligence. On the other side of this picture, there's not a single person who's overdosed in vitamins and minerals and trace minerals uh, to the point where they have to be hospitalized or anything bad happen. And so when you compare the safety of vitamins and minerals and trace minerals and compared with standard medical procedures, it's enormously safe. And that's why I'm so excited about nutrition and the pig arthritis formula and the plant-derived colloidal minerals, and that's the direction I'd go. Dr. Wallach, my 16-year-old daughter has been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. What can you do for her? Well, it's actually an easy one. We eliminated fibromyalgia in animals in 1957. And in sheep, it was called stiff lamb disease. And also in sheep and calves and foals, which are baby horses and chickens and turkeys and any, any other animal that was raised for meat, uh, the disease is uh, caused by a deficiency of three nutrients, the trace mineral selenium, vitamin E, and the sulfur-bearing amino acid methionine. And there's two things you have to do to deal with fibromyalgia. Number one, eliminate the free radicals and the trans fatty acids that actually initiate damage to the muscle and cause a scarring of the muscle tissue, which is very painful, even normal muscle movement. And you can understand why they call it stiff lamb disease if you have fibromyalgia. First of all, you eliminate fried foods, such as fried potatoes, uh, which are, you know, the teenagers live on fried potatoes, right? So you have to eliminate fried potatoes, fried chicken, fish, shrimp, fried eggs, uh, tempura, stir fry, anything fried, all margarine, salad dressings with oils in them have to be eliminated. And then again, the pig arthritis problem is perfect because it has optimal amounts of the trace mineral selenium in both the plant-derived colloidal and the chelated form. It has optimal amounts of vitamin E and the sulfur-bearing amino acid methionine. And uh, it just works like a charm. Uh, very quickly, within weeks or months, uh, they feel and they can recognize some benefit, and many people will get significant benefit very quickly. Dr. Wallach, are baby formulas enough for our babies when they're born? Unfortunately not. Uh, our, our formulas that we give to dogs, whether you know, it's kind of like um, science that dog food, are the puppy, our kitten milk replacers for puppies and kittens you're going to raise by hand, have 40 minerals in them including the uh, minerals um, lithium, chromium, vanadium, and selenium. Ralston Prino laboratory rat pellets contain 28 minerals, including lithium, chromium, vanadium, and selenium. There's not a single human milk replacer on the market, on a, off the shelf of a grocery store, that has more than 12 minerals. None of them contain lithium, chromium, vanadium, and only two, pro-soybean and infamil, have selenium in them. And uh, it's tragic that we give our dogs 40 minerals and our rats 28 and our kids 12 or less, you can begin to see why we spent $1.2 trillion for health care last year. You begin to see why we only live to be 75.5, half of our genetic potential for longevity of 120 to 140, why we only rank 17th in longevity and 19th in healthfulness, simply because we don't get the basic raw materials to develop properly and maintain repair cells from the very beginning. I'll give you a tragic example. Sudden infant death syndrome is something that everybody is familiar with. We eliminated sudden infant death syndrome in animals back in the 1950s because farmers can't afford to lose two or three or five or ten percent of the baby animals are raising to sudden infant death syndrome. And we learned that it was due to a deficiency of the trace mineral selenium, causing sudden death in the most robust and the healthiest of the baby animals in, in the group or the herd or the flock. And we eliminate it simply by giving the pregnant mothers selenium. And as soon as the baby is born or hatched, they get selenium. And if you look at the human infant milk replacers on the market, only two of all of them put selenium uh, in the formula. And so if I was going to raise a child today on these infant milk replacers, these infant milk formulas in a can or a bottle or a box, I would pick the two, pro soybean and infamil, that have selenium in them. And to stack things in favor of uh, the child, I would still give them, from the moment they're born, a teaspoon for 20 pounds of body weight of the pig arthritis formula twice a day. Obviously, you may not want to use the orange juice in a newborn baby because it can develop allergies to it, but I would still give them the plant-derived colloidal and the chelated minerals and vitamins and amino acids. And uh, the tragic example of this is 65%, this is a known fact, 65% of all the babies dying of sudden infant death syndrome in America are being fed canned milk replacers, two-thirds of the ones who die of sudden infant death syndrome are being fed these canned infant formulas. And I guarantee you, they're being fed the ones that don't have selenium in them. And so, uh, uh, absolutely, it's important to supplement these babies from birth because you can't get everything you need from your four food groups, certainly not out of these canned formulas. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm.